Why do you believe in the Trinity? I'm going to show you absolute biblical proof that the Trinity is a false doctrine in two places. Is scriptural integrity important to you? Is it okay for people to add to the Bible or the scriptures or take away from it? How important is this to you? And regarding the Trinity, you know, the Trinity people say are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three are as one. Uh, do you believe that you are in the Trinity? Are you part of the Trinity? Are you in one? Sounds absurd, right? Let's take a look at the scriptures and see what they say about this issue. First of all, regarding scripture and its integrity, in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Then in Deuteronomy 4.2, it says, you shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. And there are many other places, if you read the Bible, you know there are many other places where it, it warns about adding to or taking away from Scripture. So now, let's go to the key verse that supposedly proves the Trinity. It's in 1 John, the epistle to John, not the Gospel. 1 John 5 and verses 7 through 8. So it says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. The only problem is that about half of that was added after the year 700. It even says it in footnotes. Uh, right here, even on this footnote, it says, um, omits the words in heaven, in verse 7, through on earth, in verse 8. Only four out of five very late manuscripts contain these words in the Greek. So these were added around the year 700. The original verses skip that whole middle part which was added which supposedly proves the trinity and it just said for there are three that bear witness the spirit the water and the blood and these three agree as one i had a little trouble reading it just because to see where the that split was you'll find that even in some bibles like that where they leave out that verse okay so just ask yourself, if some scribes needed to add this verse to the scripture, which they're warned not to do, around the year 700, so the New Testament scriptures existed for all those years, and they added it in the year 700, why did they do that? And why would you trust, why would you believe in a doctrine that's not in the Bible and had to be added to the Bible? which is a dangerous thing to do when, you, when you're a true follower of the Father and Yeshua, Jesus, that you would add to the scripture. And why would it be necessary? If it were a true doctrine, it would be easily seen. It would be everywhere. And not in some analogies that people make about the sun, its heat, and its, its rays, and things like this. It would be clear in the Bible. Now, do I, is there a Father, a Son, and the Holy Spirit? Of course there are. There's no doubt. That's not the question. The, the people, who, people who do not believe in this false doctrine of the Trinity have no problem. We completely understand who the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are. Let's go to Jeremiah 8.8. 8. It says, How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Look, the false pen of the scribes certainly works falsehood. So even in Jeremiah's time, they knew that there were scribes who were false. Let's take a look in Genesis. Uh, in Genesis 1 and verse 26. 
Then Elohim said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and you know the rest. But that beginning part is the important part. So here it is. It's translated God, but the Hebrew word is Elohim. And if you've studied even just a little bit of Hebrew, you will know that masculine plural words end in im, Elohim. Eloch is God. Elohim is God's. We've been saying it wrong the whole time. It really says, then God's said, let us make, which makes sense, let us make man in our image. It doesn't say, let me make man in my image. Because Jesus, Yeshua, was always with the Father since the beginning. And he says it, he says it himself, and we're going to read um, from that chapter where he says it. You could read that on your own in John 17. But let's go on. Well, now actually we're going to go there to John 17. Uh, please, I encourage you to read the whole chapter. It completely, this is the chapter that completely refutes the Trinity. So we see that in 1 John 5, the, the uh, scripture that we just read in 1 John 5, um, 7 and 8, that they had to add to the scripture. So there was some uh, sneaky trickery going on there. And then in John 17, this is the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 6. Jesus is praying. Yeshua is praying to the Father. He's praying about him. He's praying about us. He's mostly praying for us, for our sake. He says, I have manifested your name to, to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Interesting, the, the emphasis on the word, why the word is important and the truth. You're going to see it's also, it talks about that. And that the father is giving something to the son and he's holding on to it. Then in verse 11, it says, Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name, those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. Are the Father and the Son one? Yes, it says that. We're going to read that, that verse in, uh, in, Gen in Deuteronomy. But now it says that they may be one as we are one. Uh, let's skip to that verse and we'll come back here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So this is why people say the Lord is one. There is one God. We are monotheistic, right? Well, sorry, there's the Father and the Son. That's why they came up with the Trinity. This is the reason that people have a problem with the Trinity, because they feel like there is something inferior about the Father and the Son, where I think it's incredible the way the Father, the Son, they have been together for eternity. They... The, they decided that the Son would come down to earth, and he's come down to earth many times. He talked with Moses, he talked with Abraham, he was in the garden, in the Garden of Eden, and then he was born of Mary, and he grew up and lived as Yeshua, Jesus. So, but there have, they have always existed, the Father and the Son. Yeshua, Jesus, has he who became Jesus, has always existed. And that's why it's Elohim, not Eloch. It's not just God, it's God's. They've always existed. Why does it say they are one? Well, let's go to another verse, Genesis 2, 24. It says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Go into your concordance or your interlinear Bible and look for that word. That word is echad. The same word. The same word that says the Lord, God, is one. And the one that says that a man and a wife shall become one flesh. Echad is one. So, if you're married, you should be one with your wife. Are you your wife? Is she you? No, but you should be walking together as one. You should have one plan. You should be in harmony. And that's how the Father 
and Yeshua are. And then that's why in John 17, John 17 makes perfect sense now. Now read John 17. It says, Holy Father, keep through your name those, in verse 11, those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. Ah, now it makes sense. That perfect unity, being one with them. Do we become the Father or the Son? No. Do they become us? No, but they live in us. And we are to walk together as one. And let's keep going. Go to uh, verse 17, John 17, 17. Sanctify them by your truth. The, your word is truth. The truth, this is what's important. And this is the truth. We're reading it right now. It's scripture. And now let's finish up in verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but all, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. He's praying not only about the apostles and disciples living at that time, but he's praying into the future about us, right? Those who would believe in him through their word. Their word spread, and now we are the we benefit from that. And now we are believers. He's praying about us. And what about us? In verse 21, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. There's so many other more scriptures that more scriptures that talk about this and that explain it, but and you see it all over. But as far as the Trinity, why would I believe I was brought up Catholic. I left that when I started reading the Bible because it didn't it didn't go together. Why would I believe in something that is such a strong Catholic belief, the Trinity? Why would believers, so-called Christians, believe in something that was handed down from a Catholic belief? It tells us so much throughout scripture that we're not to, I can't even go into all those scriptures that tell us to not believe in the things that were handed over and uh, taken or was surrounded Israel by the pagan countries, all of their false idol worship. And many times Israel did fall into that. Why would we want to do that? Why would we believe in Christmas or Easter or Halloween, the Easter bunny or the Trinity, all of these things that come from other pagan religions? And why is it even important for me to make this video? Why is this? I mean, because you might just say, well, it's just a different a difference of perspective. You look at it that way. I look at it this way. You know, we both believe in the Holy Spirit. But, well, the problem is because I believe that, you know, we're offered eternal life. That's what it's all about. The Father is saving us from eternal death. He's giving us eternal life. Satan was disqualified. Satan hates us. He wants to destroy us. We don't have to worry. The Father protects us. But he does have his plans, and this could be one of them, coming up with this doctrine that teaches people that the Godhead is a closed trinity. It's three in one. You will have no part of it. Well, that's false. Look at this, these verses right here. It how many times does Yeshua have to say that we are part of that oneness? It's so clear that we are part of that. So I hope you enjoy these scriptures and I hope that you uh, enjoy this teaching. I look forward to hearing your points of view on this topic.